Coming up on the Branding Deep Dive podcast. John Gray was telling me how he wrote this incredible book called Men, Women, and Relationships. Okay? And it, it sold pretty good. It is one of the best relationship books ever. But he sold about 20,000 copies, and that's not much. Okay? I mean, if, if you write a book. I mean, 20,000, if you make a buck a book, maybe it's 20,000 bucks. Not much. Okay? But he's, he, he's at a, a seminar talking to an audience trying to promote his book. And he said something, and all the women in the audience laughed like crazy. And the men looked at the women and were like, what was so funny about what he just said? And he said, you see, I mean, there's some things that women laugh at, and there's some things that men laugh at, and there's some things that everybody laughs at. You know, So there are differences. And so one of the women in the audience said, it's almost like men are from a different planet. Like, what planet are men from? And he went and he said, I guess men are from Mars. And everybody started laughing, men and women. When he got home, he started thinking, okay, if men are from Mars, where are women from? I guess women are from Venus. Venus is the god of love. And uh, then he got this crazy idea. And he said, you know, my book isn't selling. It's sold 20,000 copies and it just seems to be sitting there in bookstores. What if I, why don't I change the name of the book? And I'll put references to men are from Mars, women are from Venus throughout the book. It'll still be the same book. And let's see what happens. He sold 50, first he sold almost overnight, half a million copies, then a million, then two million, then five million. He sold, I was working with this guy, Steve Harrison, who helped promote his book and helps promote him. And I say, in my book, it says he sold 10 million copies. And Steve says, you are incorrect. He sold 50 million copies. This is Ahmed Shima, and welcome to the Branding Deep Dive podcast. If you're new here, this is a podcast where we have in-depth discussions with founders, marketers, and brand strategists on how to build a brand that people love. Today, we're talking to James I. Bond. James has been studying ordinary products turned into blockbusters for 35 years. Along the way, he uncovered a breakthrough, something that he calls brain glue. That makes your ideas sticky so they stick in your prospect's brain like glue. This activates the emotional side of the brain where decisions are made, making it much easier to get them to say yes to your ideas and buy your products. He's written a whole book on the subject, and in this episode, we'll be diving deep into why naming is so important, numerous examples of the sales a slight name change can lead to, psychological tactics that you can use to stick in your customers' minds, and much, much more. If you wanna learn more about product naming or selling more products, this episode is a must listen. Now, here's James. James, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really excited to have you here. Uh, for Thanks, the audience man. that may not be familiar with who you are and the work you've done, can you give them a brief uh, introduction? Sure. I'm one of America's leading behavioral management specialists. I'm originally from Montreal, um, and I had an advertising agency in Montreal that built up. Uh, you know, we worked our way up and eventually had some of the world's biggest uh, companies as clients, You know, Kraft Foods, Timex, Avon, Abbott Laboratories, Seagram's, the world headquarters is in Montreal. About 36 or 37 years ago, we moved to Southern California, and eventually I started and ran one of uh, California's leading behavioral management firms, um, you know, working with a who's who of American business. It was really fun, actually, lots of fun, uh, but we focused on how do you, you know, behavioral management is an interesting aspect because it's like, how do you get people to actually do things, change things outside, their, especially tackle stuff outside their comfort zone? Uh, in the process of that, something that tied the the uh, behavioral management piece with advertising was brain glue. It is uh, through my process, and we'll, I'm sure we'll chat about it. But you know, I, I, as an advertise in advertising, I'm very logical. I'm a logical person, and I suddenly got thrown with uh, you know a curve because we lost an account because the winning account was uh, um, emotional selling. And it was fabulous and it scared the hell out of me because I don't understand emotional selling. And so I, I, I figured this out, we'll go through that. But, and uh, eventually put these elements together and started to recognize all these blockbuster brands and how they're different from everybody else. Often people would change the name of their product or their book or whatever else. And suddenly they go from, you know, from like, I know this book that I'm going to talk about. It went from 20,000 to 50 million books sold. You know, he worked hard and got 20,000 books. Big deal. I mean, it's not bad, but if you make a buck a book, you still better get a job at McDonald's or something. But uh, when you sell 50 million books, even at 50 cents a book, <laughs> I, you know, that's not bad. Yeah. It's more than a lot of people make. So, uh, James, I want to start with, um, you know, something not directly related to what we're going to talk about. Do you ever get 
cut, you know, like strange looks about your name or, or like any funny stories about your name. So for the audience that's, you know, you've clicked on this, but you haven't seen the name. Um, it, you know, James goes by James I Bond. Uh, I'm assuming the I is there so you don't confuse uh, yourself with James Bond, the, um, you know, iconic fictional character. Uh, so any, any funny stories with that? Well, there's, <laughs> I have lots. People hang up on me all the time. So I have this, uh, this guy I interact with, uh, uh, and he's um, uh, um, a banker, and his name is Jesse James. It's, I don't know if that's the best name for a banker. <laughs> he's bank robber, Jesse James, uh, investment banker. And I remember calling his office and saying, it's Jesse. And, and she said, who's calling? I said, James Bond. She said, yeah, right. Click. <laughs> I, called, <laughs> I called back and she said, I'm so sorry, Mr. Bond. He was actually waiting for your call. You know, it's always funny when somebody <laughs> is laughing hysterically while they're apologizing. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know? I get that a lot. Is, is, um, did you pick this name because you wanted it to stick in people's mind? Brain glue? No, but I think, I think that's why it got me into brain glue because... You know, because my name sticks in people's minds. I go to a, you know, I'll go to an event and there'll be like 200 people there. Everybody knows my name. I've got to start remembering people's names. Right. right. Stuff. All right, let's get into it. So brain glue, um, this is an interesting concept. Can you talk to us about what brain glue is? Um, you know, like for the people that may be hearing this for the first time, uh, you, I mean, James also has a book with the title of brain glue. Um, what is brain glue first? And then I'll kind of get, get more into this. The questions there. Okay. I, I discovered something. I like to say I invented it. I invented brain glue, which ties this these elements together. And when people start looking at it, they go, oh, I start showing you things that you've seen throughout your life, but never connected that it's actually a process. Okay. And so it's a way to turn ordinary products and ideas into blockbusters. And it does it by... Um, by sticking, getting names of products, uh, the name of your product or the idea that you're presenting to stick to the brain like glue. There's like two sides of the brain. There's left brain and right brain. It's not really left because it sort of overlaps, but we call it left brain and right brain. Left brain is logic. It's the easy way to remember it. LL, left brain logic, right brain emotion. If you pitch, if you present too much logic as it turns out, you actually turn off the emotion side of the brain, and the emotion side of the brain is the decision areas and how people buy. That's why we mm -hmm. often say in marketing, we want you to low, they want them to know, like, and trust you. Well, that's only a small piece of it, okay? But that does, if, if I like you, if you like me, then you might buy from me, okay? Might. When you're mass marketing, you often don't get that luxury, unless you're like a famous person or something like that. You know, Warren Buffett has people standing in line. Hey, I'm going to sell peanuts, and they'll probably stand in line to buy his peanuts. Okay, but so um, brain glue makes your ideas sticky, so they stick to the prospect's brain like glue, making it easier to get them to say yes to your ideas and to buy your products. And it's profound how it works. I mean, when you start to understand it, and you start to see how it works, and I when I first started recognizing how powerful brain glue is and how it works, I started applying it to my clients. And their sales exploded. I mean, exploded. I had these three guys who were in business for 10 years, a construction company. I have no experience with construction, but I said I worked with them. And as I applied brain glue, and I'll, I'll show you how I did it, but as I applied brain glue, suddenly their sales went from 2 million. After 10 years, they had 2 million in sales. That's not bad. Ha <laughs> ha. I took them into 10 million in one year. And then they went to 32 million two years later. And so, how did I do it? Okay. So, what I did was, they're a, a construction company, you know, moderate size or small construction company, three guys. And, and of course, they subcontract all stuff out. And so I said, I pull out a whiteboard and I said, let's make a shopping list of all the different types of markets you're going after, all the different types of clients you go after. Okay. Took a while. I, you know, I really had to dig what else, what else. And then they finally, they came up with a list. It took about an hour to do this on a whiteboard. Then I said, okay, we're going to play a game. I want you to pick just one that if you're going to focus on just one type of client, who would you focus on and say no to everybody else? They said, we don't want to say no to everybody. So I got it, but we're playing a game. Let's figure this out. Took a while. And they finally came up with this one group that they had worked with two insurance companies and they did fire restoration for insurance companies. You know, I didn't know what that was back then, but they explained it. And it's basically a, a, an insurance company that has a client that has a fire, you know, mm -hmm. 
And there are things you want to check, like if the frame is damaged, you got to tear down the whole building. If it isn't, then you want to put it up and you want to make sure it isn't going to catch fire again and all that stuff, okay? I said, okay, so that's the market you go after is fire restoration for insurance companies. So we need to come up with a brain glue name, okay? And so brain glue says, let's pick something that already sticks in the brain, okay? So if they're dealing with fire, fire should be in the word. It shouldn't always be, but in this case, I said, let's put fire in the word. So why don't you we'll call you guys the fire extinguisher for insurance companies, and we'll give you the website firex.com. Mm -hmm. When you're talking to a client, you say, hey, look, we're the fire extinguisher for insurance companies. So every time you get a client that has a fire, call us in, we'll extinguish it for you. We won't put it out if it's on fire. <laughs> the fire department do that, but we'll extinguish it, like we'll fix it, okay? Right. And suddenly, because they, they were called like, calling themselves the fire extinguisher, the clients would laugh, but they would call them <laughs> over and over mm. and over again. And they, in one year, they went from two to 10 million in sales. They told me initially, we're not gonna turn down work, that's not Fire X, okay? Well, let me tell you, overnight, they said, ah, forget that. We got so much business on this one. We can't even handle we're saying no to everybody else. And then it went to from 2 to 10 and then to 32 million in sales, all because they came up with a name that resonated with it. Uh, they had a service that made sense. But there are a lot of people, a lot of construction companies that service, you know, if there's a fire. Mm -hmm. But they had a name that stuck to the brain. And so every time they had a client with a fire, they went, fire, oh, I got to call a fire extinguisher, <laughs> you know? And it just it resonated like crazy. So what made me originally think of this is, so I'm from Montreal. I built an advertising agency. And I work my way up. I'm very logical. You know, I come from a technical background. And so because of that, I didn't realize that logic is actually the enemy of persuasion. Yeah, I never knew that. I thought you'd, I teach people explain logically. There are these two massive studies that found that 90, more than 90% of decision making happens on the emotion side. And if you throw too much logic at a person, you actually turn off the emotion inside where decisions happen. I didn't know that. So so uh, I won major clients, Kraft, Telemix, Avon, Abbott Laboratory, Seagram, stuff like that. And we had an opportunity to win the anti-drug campaign in America and came up with a fantastic, I thought it was fantastic, uh, logic, logical reasons why you shouldn't do drugs. Okay. And then we lost. And they liked the campaign, but then we lost, and we lost for good reason. We lost by, to these guys that came up with a campaign and had a guy holding an egg with a sizzling frying pan and said, this is your brain, and cracked the shell, dropped the egg into the sizzling frying pan, really exaggerating the sizzling sound, so really boost the motion, and said, this is your brain on drugs. Any questions? And when I saw it, first, I knew right away it was a gazillion times better than the ad we did, okay, that we were producing. But second is it scared the hell out of me. The reason it scared me was because this was emotional selling. And I had I could sell logically, but how do you sell emotionally? I couldn't figure out even how did they come to, you know, how did they put this ad together? Where did they get the idea to be able to do emotional selling? And I realized they don't teach emotional selling in school. I went to the library. There's like superficial things on emotional selling, but there's nothing really on emotional selling. So what I did was I said, I'm going to, I took a box. And I called it my passion box. And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I, I wrote on a three by five card, your brain on drugs. So I'd remember the ad and I put it inside the passion box. And I said, I'm not going to overanalyze it for a while. What I'm going to do is every time I see an ad or hear a quote that is using emotional selling, I'm going to write it down or tear it out and put it in a, in, a in my box. In fact, it's kind of funny. My wife hated going to doctor's offices with me. And the reason is because I'd be looking through a magazine. I go like, ah, oh, wow, look at this ad. She go, do not tear it out of the magazine. No, no, I have to put it in my passion box. She go, do not. She'd sit as far away from my, as from me as possible. I do not know that guy. Okay, I tear it out. So I, yeah, I've been doing it for thirty five years. By the way, the passion box. So you can imagine how much stuff is in there. Okay, but so it was really powerful for me, and I just started accumulating things. Initially, it was just ads I would put in there, but eventually, I would put phrases. I'm old enough to remember President John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. And they had really power phrases. JFK said, uh, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And I went, whoa, there's a pattern there. Something's really cool. I don't know what it is, but I got to write it down and put it in my box. Eventually, I learned it's something called chiasmus, which I'll tell you about in a couple of minutes. But it's actually a term called chiasmus. And even comedians use this. 
Okay, so I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. <laughs> That's uh, comedians mm. use it. I mean, there are lots of. I got one. Um, I'd rather wake up and pee than pee and wake up. <laughs> okay, that uses chiasmus, and I'll explain how chiasmus works in a, in a couple of seconds, but or a couple of minutes. But the point is, I started recognizing their patterns. So what I did was when I came to, I moved to California. Um, John Gray was telling me how he wrote this incredible book called Men, Women, and Relationships. Okay. And it, it sold pretty good. It, it is one of the best relationship books ever. But he sold about 20,000 copies, and that's not much. Okay. I mean, if, if you write a book, I mean, 20,000, if you make a buck a book, maybe it's 20,000 bucks, not much. Okay. But he's, he, he's at a, a seminar talking to an audience trying to promote his book. And he said something, and all the women in the audience laughed like crazy. And the men looked at the women and were like, what was so funny about what he just said? And he said, you see, I mean, there's some things that women laugh at, and there's some things that men laugh at, and there's some things that everybody laughs at, you know, so there are differences. And so one of the women in the audience said, it's almost like men are from a different planet. Like, what planet are men from? And he went and he said, I guess men are from Mars. And everybody started laughing, men and women. When he got home, he started thinking, okay, if men are from Mars, where are women from? I guess women are from Venus. Venus is the god of love. And uh, and he got this crazy idea, and he said, you know, my book isn't selling. It sold 20,000 copies, and it just seems to be sitting there in bookstores. What if I, why don't I change the name of the book? And I'll put references to Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus throughout the book. It'll still be the same book, and let's see what happens. He sold 50, first he sold almost overnight, half a million copies, then a million, then two million, then five million. He sold, I was working with this guy, Steve Harrison, who helped promote his book and helps promote him. And I say, in my book, it says he sold 10 million copies. And Steve says, you are incorrect. He sold 50 million copies. Sorry, you know, 50 million books. That's not bad, you know. Well, just off by 40 million. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, really. So, so money flowed in like crazy just because he changed the title. And that made me realize, like, wow, it's true that there are certain things that stick to the brain and, and get people want to, wanting to buy more than other things. I mean, I have my book. My book used to be called – it's called Brain Glue now. I presented it to Jack Canfield, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, which, by the way, you think <laughs> Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus sold a lot. Chicken Soup for the Soul, the book sold 100 million copies, and then all the other chicken soup. Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul, Chicken Soup for the Cancer Survivor Soul, sold 400 million copies. He sold 500 million books, half a billion. Like how many people are on the planet? Okay. That's crazy. But he sold 500 million. He was telling me that his book, he was thinking, he wrote the book and it's 101 story, uh, motivational stories, okay? And hopefully it will change your life because they're really motivational and powerful. And he was struggling. He didn't want to say 100, 101 motivational stories because – that just goes in one ear and out the other, okay? He was thinking and thinking. One day he woke up and he said, chicken soup makes people feel really good if, if you're sick. And so my book makes people feel really good. So I should call it chicken soup. He was going to call it chicken soup for the spirit. But the more he thought about it, he said, spirit doesn't sound right. And he, and he used something called alliteration, which is the repetition of sound. And it's amazing. I'll tell you how many companies use alliteration to become blockbusters of success. But for him, he went S-O-U-P, S-O-U-L, chicken soup for the soul. That makes more sense. And he, when he changed the title of the book, suddenly it became easier. It took him a little, a little while for people to understand what the book was, but the book took off and sold 500 billion copies. Going back to Steve, uh, to um, John Gray. So John Gray, when he changed his title, uh, the chicken soup for the uh, sorry to men are from Mars, women are from Venus. I started I, when I got home. I realized I'm going to put it in my passion box, and I went, no, wait, this is too important. I got to dump my passion box on my bed, and I got to see are there groupings that I can put people uh, things in. Like this is a metaphor or analogy, okay? Because we're not really from a different planet. I, at least I don't think so. I mean, you think we're from a different planet, those guys? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> the girls think so. But anyway, but. I started realizing things like uh, the TV show um, Shark Tank. It's not a tank full of sharks. Probably feels like it when you're on the show, but it's not a tank full of sharks, you know. But it resonates with the brain. It sticks to the brain. And if they called it the the investors group, do you think it would be as successful as Shark Tank? I don't think so, you know. And then I remember I was watching this show on Discovery Channel about uh, the history of Dryer's Ice Cream, 
And Dry as Ice Cream uh, started around the Great Depression. And, uh, you know, they had chocolate ice cream, vanilla ice cream, and strawberry ice cream. Those are the ice creams. And they decided to take chocolate ice cream, put nuts in it, and put marshmallows in it. And they wanted to come up with a name. They actually stole the name from someone else. But they called it Rocky Road Ice Cream. And sales exploded. They were struggling. But once they came up with Rocky Road, sales exploded. And I mean exploded. And so why did sales explode? So first, it's a metaphor because it's not really rocks, okay? It's 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 ice cream. The second thing is it's Rocky Road. R R it uses alliteration, a repetition of sound. And so Rocky Road, the repetition of sound. When I started realizing alliteration, the concept, I started realizing. Look at how many major brands use alliteration: uh, Coca Cola, PayPal, Best Buy, uh, TikTok. You know, if TikTok was called. Uh, the uh, Chinese social media platform, you think it would be as successful as TikTok? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Nope. You know, so these guys recognize that uh, that uh, alliteration and repetition of sound can be tremendously powerful. Now, if you take uh, go back to Rocky Road ice cream, they also use humor. And the way they use humor was it was it was uh, introduced back in the Great Depression. The Great Depression was called they had a. a, a, a a keyword, I mean, a way they call it, they called it the uh, the rocky road. We're all on a rocky road, okay? So uh, so the guys at uh, Dryer's Ice Cream said, you know, the concept is we're on a rocky road. We might as well eat rocky road ice cream, which is kind of funny. And the sales took off like gangbusters. So they have, they have you know, there's there a whole bunch of brands. So um, there's uh, Carrie Smith, and Carrie Smith um, had a small company. And he had enough money he could buy another company. He bought this small company and made fans, really big fans. And so he's thinking, okay, so um, I've got these fans. They're used in farms. Mostly they were used in farms. You know, it's like in a barn, you're not going to put an air conditioner in a barn, but you'll put a big fan in a barn so air circulates for the cows. And so he thought, okay, it's really good. And one day he came up with this crazy idea and he said, Why not? he ran an ad for a crazy, uh, big ass fans. Okay. <laughs> and sales exploded. And he went, wait a second, maybe I should call my company big ass fans. So he said, what will happen? Let's see what happens. So he changed the name of his company to big ass fans and sales took off like crazy. And he had a really funny logo and the logo was a, um, uh, a mule, <laughs> okay, an ass <laughs> with his butt facing you. And his head is turned, so it's facing you also. And it says, big ass fans, you're looking at ass, you know, I'm, I'm a mule. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I worked in operations. Uh, so like I was in warehouses and stuff, and there's, those were everywhere, uh, those giant fans. Uh, and in fact, what it did, which was really powerful, was he says he sold a company after 15 years for half a billion dollars, okay? Most people are lucky if they can make any money selling their company after 15 years. But he made half a billion dollars. He said it was like it focused him because so what he did was sales were growing like crazy and he started adding other products that were not fans. And then he realized this is distracting me. People are buying fans because we're big ass fans. So we're going to find more uses for fans and more shapes for fans. But we're going to sell just big ass fans. And it got him to focus. But because he had that name, it kept him focused and it helped the company become a monster. And, Funny, okay, big ass fans. I mean, how can you not laugh? But it resonated with people and it stuck to their brain, and people recognized, well, we got to buy, you know, I got four big ass fans. We got a big, uh, you know, uh, warehouse that we want to put, uh, you know, uh, fans in. And and there are lo there are lots of examples like this that use these tools that suddenly build turn a brand into a monster. I mean, there's um there's a, a couple in Utah husband and wife that were um, sitting in the bathroom on the toilet and came up with this incredible idea of a little toilet stool, okay, where you raise your legs and it changes the shape of your body a little bit so it's easier to go to the bathroom. I don't want to get too much into that, but yeah. uh, but uh, they came up with the idea and they said, what do we want to call it? And so using alliteration and repetition of sound and a little bit of rhyme, they called it Squatty Potty. In two years, in less than two years, they reached a hundred million dollars of sales, and these are two people that had virtually no business experience. But because the name they had was so powerful, their sales took off like crazy. So one of the things I have people do in an exercise is, um, uh, you know, think of an analogy or a metaphor that's like out of the, out of the box, something crazy. So here's a, somebody who came up with it. it wasn't my student, but he could have been uh, Paul Tran. 
So he decided to come up with uh, um, an electric razor ma- sh- ra- that shaves man's private areas. Okay. <laughs> and, but he wanted to come up with a name that doesn't offend people, but still makes it obvious what he sells. So what do you think he came up with? The this lawnmower. Is, uh, yeah. The lawnmower. And he called his, his company um, uh, Manscaped. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean – People are laughing while they're buying the product, and he's selling like crazy. A major company wanted to buy his company. He said, "No, I'm making too much money." So, but he's just. It, we start to recognize that there are certain tools that you use that resonate with the brain and make people want to buy your product. Just one example, quickly, before you ask the question, because I know you want, know you want to ask the question. I don't want to forget this. So, this mom, she's she's a stay at home mom, and she's stuck with two kids, and she wanted she created a Facebook page. And she wanted to create a Facebook page that attracted other moms. And she wanted to get lots of moms connecting so she could really have fun with them. And she was thinking about it. She said, well, mommy needs time to herself. You know, mommy needs, you know, some free time. I know what mommy needs. Mommy needs vodka. So she <laughs> called her, her, her web, her Facebook page, mommy needs vodka. Guess how many, how many fans she has? Five million fans. I wow. remember I'm looking at it and I go, I see a funny, a, a, a funny post from her. And I go, oh, that's really funny. Mommy needs vodka? What? And I, <laughs> I clicked on that. It took me right to her page. I look at some of their posts. And I, oh, I got to join this. This is great. And most people do that because it's the power of something that sticks to the brain and resonates that makes you, you know, want to connect with them and actually buy. And this is a powerful way to turn a brand into a huge money maker. Awesome. Yeah, I wanted to. You just dropped a lot, James. So there's a, I have a bunch of notes here of things that I wanted to, you know, dive deeper on and just ask you about. First thing I wanted to just kind of mention um, for myself and also for the audience is that, like, you know, when we talk about the concept of like an expert in something. Uh, one of the the ways you know someone's an expert is this concept of pattern recognition, right? So, like, um, the example that I, I was in a book uh, by David Baker, I believe. And he um, he mentioned like the scene and have you seen a beautiful mind? Yeah, oh, yeah. So like when he sees like all the like all that like alphabet numerals on the screen, then he just starts to kind of connect the patterns there. That's what you know the example of an expert is. So like all these campaigns, you know, that you mentioned, a lot of these we've seen as well. You know, normal people people that are listening have seen, but we didn't see those patterns, right? And so that's one thing. Just wanted to kind of for the audience and for myself, just uh, reminded me of the definition of an expert. Um, and so next thing I wanted to, I just wanted to mention is that, you know, it's not bad to lose or like to come second place to this is your brain on drugs campaign. Cause that's like, that's taught everywhere. You know what I mean? Like every like, uh, like top 10 ads of all time, it's, it's on there. So, you know, I, I wouldn't feel too bad if I lost to that. <laughs> I want. I, I yeah. thought the idea was amazing. You know, this is like more powerful than anything we know how to do. And I'm fascinated right. by persuasion. So it was like, first, it freaked me out because like, huh, they're gonna, we can't do that. But second, it made me ex- fascinated because I was like, how did he do that? How did they come up with it? Now I know, you know, it's easy because I understand brain glue. It's, you know, well, what is, you know, what happens to your brain when your brain gets fried on drugs? Oh, what else gets fried? Eggs. Oh, let's do an ad about your brain getting, an egg getting yeah. fried and saying it's your brain. That's how brain glue works. And then when you understand the process, you go, I can do that. I can do that for somebody else. In fact, I was, um, you know, Wally Amos did famous Amos cookies. Okay. Hmm. And it became a blockbuster of success. And I saw him on Shark Tank. And he had another product that was totally different. It had no alliteration. Because famous Amos is rhyme, alliteration, it's a repetition of sound, as well as Wally Amos is kind of cool. And so he sold the company, Famous Amos, and he has another product. And it doesn't relate to Famous or Amos or anything, okay? Poor Wally. And he's struggling because he can't get money to um, to uh, sell the product. And he, it, part of the problem he had, I realized, and he, they didn't even invest in Shark Tank. They didn't even invest in him. Poor guy, you know. He's struggling. I mean, he's not struggling. He sold and he made some money, but you know, but he he they wouldn't even let him have his. Fic- he's not allowed to use his name or his face, okay, as the uh-huh. brand, okay. And so he's struggling. And so I was thinking, like, if he knew Brain Glue, he'd understand this. So you can't do Famous Amos, but you can do Wally. So why don't we call it Wally Balls? <laughs> And make little cookies mm. that are round instead of, you know, and you can have it this way. And your logo would be the back of your head with your hat on. And say, <laughs> I'm not allowed to show my face. And you could have a riot with that and Wally balls. 
You know, it's like when people understand how Brain Glue works, you can start putting it together in different ways. Okay, you're not going to allow me to use my name, my last name, because famous Amos, but my first name I could use Wally. So Wally Amos, so Wally Balls, there we go, you know, and you have fun. And I think it's when, when we recognize, I mean, I had Steve, um, uh, Jack Canfield did a chicken soup for a soul. And he was telling me he's got like 60, about 65 or 66 other books, and they don't use Brain Glue. You know, th that one was the one that made him famous, it was profound. You know, he woke up in the middle of the night and came up with the idea and he started molding it and all that stuff. But with the other ones, he was famous. So he, he, anything he published was going to sell because people knew he was famous. So he said, I would just have light, right brain uh, descriptions of our titles of my product. And that took him to mine because when I met him, my book was called Sell More with a Right Brain Marketing Strategy, which is left brain, by the way, not right brain. <laughs> and he said, you, you're you can't do that i said what he said you're teaching us all how to do right brain selling and you got a left brain title what are you doing right. you have to change the title to brain glue because all books about brain glue and i'm like do i have to he said yes you have to <laughs> you know i mean when, when jack cancel tells you to do something you gotta do it i mean especially in marketing but he said no you gotta understand you know i understand you're a logical person we all most of us are but selling has to trigger the right side of the brain, the emotion side of the brain. And that's where, you know, your book is not, you, you know, it's funny because when I changed the title from sell more with the right brain marketing strategy to brain glue, almost everybody I know who knows me and who is referring the book to other people because they love the book, they thanked me because they couldn't remember the damn name of the other book. <laughs> I refer a book, but I can't remember it. Your name's James Bond, so I can't find you because I get all this James Bond stuff coming up. <laughs> Now I can tell it's brain yeah. glue. I want to I want to ask you about this. Um, this is a personal thing that I kind of went through, and also I'm sure a lot of small business owners and people that are looking to uh, get into the space go through is like when they start, um, you know, finding the right name or finding the right way to describe your product and services is just so tough. I remember I had a conversation with uh, a guy. He asked me, um, hey, "So like, so what are you doing?" And I'm just like fumbling over my words. I was like, we also do this. We also do a little bit of that. Um, and then, you know, it's just like, at, at the end of it, I was confused. He was confused. He, he knew I had like some kind of company, but he, didn't, he had no idea what I did. Right. And so I, I wish I had read Brain Glue before, but you know, for, for someone in that situation, what are some techniques that we can actually get into? Um, and I think this is not only just applicable to like small businesses, but like when you're talking about this, where my mind goes to is like, you look at YouTube, um, writing headlines, titles, writing yep. articles, right? Like yep. getting people's attention in any way, shape, or form. Like, it, you know, like if you listen to any of the Mr. Beast interviews, like they spend a lot of time just thinking about like their title and thumbnail, right? So, like, title part of it, like, how can you convince people to like, how can you stand out? And, and, you know, using these techniques is a, is a, is a great way to uh, hone your skills and really perfect those titles so that people are actually interested in your product, actually interested in your service, and they're actually curious. So, can we get into some? I know you have 14 techniques in the book. Can we get into a couple of them? Um, yeah. Dive into you know how to actually apply them. Yeah, but I want to apply something first, okay? Before we get into the 14 techniques, so you got 14 techniques, okay? What you want to do is come up with logically what the what your product or book is, okay? Don't turn off logic. You want to start with logic. I want to give you a, a powerful reason why. Remember the gut milk campaign. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot of people love it. From a marketing standpoint, it was terrible. And I'm going to tell you why. Here's an article in Business Week that I have. And it's called Got Milked. After $385 million, sales still continue to decline for milk. Okay, I have the Brain Glue book and I have the Got the Milk Mustache book. I love those books. Okay, one of my kids has a milk mustache poster with I forget who's on it, but somebody famous. Okay, people love the campaign. But why do people stop drinking milk? Okay, it doesn't give people a reason to drink milk. People stop drinking milk because, you know, you used to need milk because of calcium, because it strengthens your bones. But you can get calcium mm -hmm. from like spinach. So that's one thing, okay? The second thing is, um, um, you want, um, like, why do we drink milk? We drink milk because, oh, here's why you don't drink milk because of lactose intolerance. A lot of people think they have lactose intolerance. And so, in fact, even if you ha don't have lactose intolerance, I don't have lactose. I don't have lactose intolerance. You know, it doesn't make me sick every time I drink milk. But I think 
psychologically, maybe I have a little bit of it, so I should go easy on milk. It's stupid because I, I, I know I don't have lactose intolerance. But if somebody has lactose intolerance and you say, hey, got milk? You'll love the campaign, but you're not going to buy milk. And you have to remember, mm. give them a reason why. Squatty potty. You know, squatty potty. I talked about squatty potty, right? And so yeah. squatty, they could call it the toilet stool, but it doesn't, you know, squatty potty. You're going to squat and you're going to go to the bathroom. And then it's, it's tr- it sort of explains to you a little bit why it works. Okay. And so what you want to do is you want to remember, you still have to sell, but you have to sell with the right brain words. And so the first thing you do is, Come up with a logical description of what your product is. Mine was sell more with the right brain marketing strategy. Okay, now I'm going to go through the brain glue tool. Now I'm going to go through the brain glue tools, and one of them is analogy or metaphor. So metaphor, what's it? It's, it's brain glue. I, it's easy because I talk about brain glue because it sticks to the brain like glue. That's how I came up with it. I said I'm talking about things that stick to the brain like glue. Oh, I should call it brain glue. Okay, hmm. and it comes through when you start doing that. And so the first thing you want to do, I think, with everybody is co- try to come up with the craziest analogy you could think of, okay? Mm. Just go – think outside the box. Start logic, okay? But then go crazy. We had a behavioral management firm. It was very complicated, the stuff we did. And it was profound, the results we had. But when we start explaining it to people, their eyes would glaze over. So I came up with the analogy and I said, hey, look, it's like we're like a personal trainer, a personal coach that shows up at your house. You know, five o'clock in the morning, and or, you know, hopefully not five, but whatever, shows up at your house and gets you to do more push-ups than you would do on your own. Okay, we're the same as we'll take your senior executives or senior all your senior people, we'll get them to tackle something a little bigger than they would normally tackle on their own. And so, we're, with a with push-ups, if you can do five push-ups, I can get you to do fifteen, okay, or twenty. With me. With you, we show up with your people, and if they're going to tackle this thing, we're going to tackle this thing, which is a little bigger. We're not going to climb Mount Everest, we'll get a little bigger. And as a result of that, your sales are going to explode, or your business will turn around, or whatever else it is. When we gave them the analogy or metaphor, suddenly it went, Oh, that makes sense. And suddenly we went from eyes glazed over to that makes sense. And so, to me, you always want to start with analogy. Hmm. Next thing you do is and just really have fun with it and really bounce ideas off. You know, somebody, I mean, think of what a crazy idea the lawnmower is. He must have been laughing. Lawnmower, <laughs> it's really good. But then he stopped and went, what if we actually named it the lawnmower? No, you can't do that. You know, people are going to say, no, you can't do that. That's like too funny. Why can't I do that? Huh. Hmm. Uh, you really want to take all your time? You want to take all your risk and put it into the lawnmower? Yeah, why not? And man, he became, he's massively wealthy. Okay. But so you want to think of an analogy or metaphor first, a crazy one. The second one you do is think of all the words that relate to your product or service. Okay. And then find words that uh, rhyme with it. I'll give you two examples. One is uh, squatty potty is an easy one. Uh, okay, uh, because you squat, okay, when you're in the potty. Okay, potty is one word. So you can probably came up with potty. What's, what are similar synonyms for toilet? Toilet, potty, potty. Okay, what rhymes with potty? Uh, squatty, ha, huh? you know, bam, and, that, and, that, and then you get your ideas, okay? So I had this lady that told me, can you help me? You're an expert in brain glue. I always get worried when people say that. John Gray, who did Metaphor Mars, Women from Venus, you know what he told me? He said, never tell people you're an expert. He said, I'm, I'm supposed to be an expert in man-woman relationships, and I go home, and my wife proves me wrong. So never say <laughs> that, okay? Call yourself a specialist. So I'm a specialist, okay? But she says, you're an expert in brain glue. Help me with my son. He's 14 years old. He said, um, Mommy, why do we have to follow so many rules in life? And how do you answer that? So the first thing I did was I said, okay, what rhymes with rules? Fools. So only fools don't follow rules. So there's one line, okay? But I said, let me come up with an analogy or a metaphor too. So I'm thinking about it and I went, okay, I got this one. I sat down with her and her son and I said, if you're asking your mom, why do we have to follow so many rules in life, right? He said, yeah. So I said, well, when you're thirsty, you can drink out of the toilet. But why would you want to? Remember, only fools don't follow rules. And he looks at me and he goes, hmm, that makes sense. You know, does it really make sense or did I just trigger parts of the brain? But it's powerful because I use tools like that, okay, that come out of the brain group. So think of, first think of an analogy or metaphor that's crazy, as crazy as possible. And, 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 and don't turn, you know, don't, don't dismiss them. Just capture them all, okay? Um, then, um, then think of words 
all the words that relate to your product or service, and then words that rhyme with them. And that's where you'll come up with one. I have one, lights the fire of desire in your buyer. Okay, how's that one? How about this one? Okay, and this one I'm going to cheat because I got it off ChatGPT. I said, ChatGPT, I put my description of my book and I said, give me funny phrases. And it, and it, it would 99.999% of them were stupid, but one of them was pretty good. It said, why brain glue? Because plain glue doesn't stick to the brain. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a slogan, okay? When you when you come up with words that are relate to your product or service, then come up with rhyming words. And take some time, you know, just come up with one. So like qu- potty, they came up with squatty and went, oh, wait a second, squatty potty. You know, squatty potty, huh, that works. I mean, it was squat, we squat. So squat potty, squatty potty, hey, that works. And it, it, once you start doing these, using these exercises, it actually it, it resonates and it helps you come up with uh, names. Now, James, let me ask you this. I think I'd be, um, uh, you know, I think a lot of people that may be listening to this, they may, you may hear this actually from people that uh, have read your book or, you know, people that have heard your interviews and stuff. They may say like, can it, can a catchphrase or a name really be responsible for the change? Like, you know, all these examples you gave, right? Like there must be more to it. Or there must be something else that's happening. Is it really? How do you respond to people that that you know have this kind of skepticism? We think that it's got to be a blockbuster. It's like oh wow, and all that stuff. It's not. It's subtle. It's subtle. Make changes. You know, when when somebody I saw this ad. I saw these two ads. There's a thing called Mech Labs. Okay, Mech Labs is awesome for marketers because they they'll take advertising from a major company like Procter and Gamble or something. They'll do testing, and suddenly the sales will explode. And they have these two ads. This is so subtle, it's mind blowing. I wish I could show it to you. I don't have a sample of it here, but it's two ads for Aetna, okay, or a division of Aetna Health Insurance. And it, they look exactly the same, but one of them has six and a half times the number of people called who are qualified leads. Six and a half times. And I show this to people and they go, like, Can you tell me which one it is? And nobody could. I couldn't initially do. I look at the two, they look the same until you realize what they did. One of them is selling the product or the Aetna insurance, whatever it is, the other was selling the call. The one that's selling the call recognizes what's the next step. Like for me, if you go to one of my web pages, it says, go to Amazon and just look at the free stuff on the book. You know, I want to buy the book. So I want to say, go buy the book, but I don't say that. I say, go to Amazon and just check out the book. Because that's the, the if they want to buy the book, they, they or they go to a bookstore. But if they want to buy the book, what's the next step? People say it's subtle, and that's why we pass on it, okay? Mm-hmm. I can't tell you. I, I do workshops for a small business administration, okay, for U.S. Small Business Administration, and we'll have like 200 or 300 people in some of the classes. And I come, I, I, and not everybody applies it. People read and they go really good. I've given exercises inside the book. Now, actually, when you buy the book, at the end of the book, it actually tells you that you can get a free, um, you know, for opt-in, but you get a free um, uh, workbook or action guide that shows you how to plug it all together. So it's re- you can make it easier, a little easier. But the book has exercises, and I can't tell you how many people say, I just tried this with my product, and suddenly it's selling like crazy. And, really? if, and then they say, you know, I was thinking about it. I tried it. I you know, I did a split test and all that stuff, and suddenly sales exploded. And it's that's what fools us is because we expect it to be, I got I to gotta make this really, really big. When in fact, you know, Minutes Mars Women from Venus, does that sound like a big change? It doesn't sound like a big change. And yet from 20,000 to 50 million, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's right. mind blowing. And that's what people are saying is like, as they try it and start applying it, they're making more money than they ever made. I mean, think of your Facebook page. This is a lady that never even, she never even promoted it. She didn't spend a nickel promoting it. All these people spent all this money promoting her Facebook page. And she's, you know, mommy needs vodka. And she's got 5 million fans. I mean, she didn't do anything except she came up with a name that's a hook. And it brain hooks, you know, brain. your brain isn't going to explode when a brain hook gets triggered because it's inside mm-hmm. the brain. But what mm-hmm. happens is, it's just when the brain gets triggered, so I'll, I'll, let me use Men from Mars, Women from Venus as a good example. So what's the if you're in a bookstore, what's the first step to buying the book? Picking it up, right? Sure. So I remember I was in a bookstore and I saw books, 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 Men from Mars, Women from Venus. Oh, that's weird. First thing I did was I picked it up. 
<laughs> There's a good chance I'm going to buy it if I picked it up, right? Even if only 10% of the people pick it up, buy it, or 5%, you know, if you can get a gazillion people buy it, picking it up, then you're going, to, you're going to make a lot of money. And so I picked it up and I went, Men from Mars, Never Venus, look, and I started looking through it. Oh, this looks really cool. And I ended up buying the book. Okay, but I picked it up first. And so if we can trigger the first, the first piece that we have is can you get them engaged? And the reason is because we're so bombarded with information that we need to stand out from the crowd. And I'll give you a perfect example of this, okay? With little kids, I have grandkids now, but even with my kids, I did this when we were, they were small. We would do this head and shoulders, knees and toes, eyes, ears, mouth and nose, okay? So everybody knows that. Certainly when I was a kid, everybody knows that. So if you're coming up with a dandruff shampoo and you're Procter & Gamble, what do you think you should call your dandruff shampoo? Head and shoulders, it resonates. Yes, they spent a lot of money in, on marketing and everything else. But if it was called something else like Procter & Gamble shampoo, do you think it would be as successful as head and shoulders? No, because there's something about it. Because we're, you know, people are walking across the street looking at their phones. I mean, we're doing texts and, and watching stuff on the internet and stuff like that. We're bombarded with information. And because we're so bombarded, the first thing in marketing with your brand is it needs to stop. So wait, what's that? What's that? Huh, that's interesting. Wait, what's that? And if we can st stick to the brain so that it stops ignoring us, then we have a better chance of making a sale. And it's profound mm -hmm. because we're so bombarded with information. How often do we stop and go, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, <laughs> you know, right. uh, women, mommy needs vodka. Huh. I mean, how many pages do you look at? How many posts do you look at before you go, oh, interesting. mommy needs vodka? What? You just stopped. Okay. And then you're going to mm -hmm. click on the link. Okay. Mommy needs vodka. Oh, wow. He's got some pretty cool things. I got to definitely be a fan, you know, or whatever, you know, I mean, that's how that's how profound, and we forget it. We think we gotta blow it up. <laughs> I gotta hear the sound like, Wah! you know, that doesn't. That's, you know, we can dress like clowns in clown costumes, and it'll get attention, but it's not gonna make sales. For the audience that does want to learn more um, and, and really wants to dive deep into each of these techniques and how they can uh, apply them to their own business, their own uh, brands, or whatever they're working on, where can they find the book? And then where can they find you on the internet? Or do you have like a the social media profile that you kind of post on or, uh, you know, is there any way people can get in touch with you? Well, there's the easiest way to do it. There are two ways to do it. Okay. The easiest way to do it is braingluebook.com. Okay. If you go to braingluebook.com, it'll take you to the Amazon page. And then if you don't, you don't have to buy the book. Just look at what Amazon should let you see free parts of it. There's also an audio book and definitely listen to the uh, part of the audio book. Cause it's how uh, we picked like one of the funniest stories in the audio book about, uh, a city in Canada that came up with such an out outrageous uh, uh, slogan that, in fact, let me give you a slogan, not this slogan, because I don't want to mess the story with that one. But uh, so there's a there's a, a company out there that came up with a slogan. They had it in North America for a short period of time, but people were offended. So they apologized. But they have this slogan all around the world, except in North America. And it's screw yourself. Who do you think that is? I don't know. Have you ever been to an IKEA store? IKEA furniture store? Oh. And it yeah, makes yeah. sense because <laughs> everything you buy from IKEA, you gotta screw it yourself. They give you the screws and sometimes the screwdrivers right, right. and stuff. And IKEA's slogan is screw yourself. Now, people too many people said, Oh, we're offended, so they went, Okay, we don't want to offend people. So they stopped it. <laughs> this one is like that. It's a Canadian city that uh, nobody heard of until they see the hear the slogan, and then suddenly, you know, even Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones and, and Madonna repeat it the slogan because it's so hilarious people have bumper stickers of it and after like two or three years they finally said okay we're going to stop doing it after their their uh tourism tripled okay because people went who the heck's the this is hilarious what they have t-shirts and bumper stickers of it and so i, I tell you and if you just go to uh bringbluebook.com and click on the audiobook it has that story but it's like stuff like that where people go like, you know, often we're an inch away, a millimeter away from something that's going to turn our, our product or idea into a blockbuster. We don't realize it. But as we go through it with brain glue, 
And that's one of the biggest things people tell me is they go through it and they go like, oh, I know all of these things. I never put these together. I never realized rhyme is really powerful. I mean, O.J. Simpson trial, you know, uh, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. Well, most attorneys would say, if the glove doesn't fit my client, you have to let him go. But he said, no, John, uh, uh, Johnny Cochran recognized the power of a brain glue tool called rhyme. You know, we remember, I remember rhymes from when I was a little kid. You know, uh, Jack and Joe went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. I mean, I, the last time I heard that was like 60 years ago. I'm old. <laughs> but I, and I, on my deathbed, you could start the, po- to start the rhyme and I'll be able to finish it because it sticks to the brain. And so that's why, you know, braingluebook.com will at least take you to the book so you could see what's there, some of the tools. And then people will start to recognize, wow, this is, makes sense. Oh, I can see that. And then, and then the next step is, to start applying it to your product or idea, and it'll help you turn your brand into a blockbuster in most cases. Awesome. Thank you so much, James. Really appreciate you coming on and sharing your insight. Now, as always, I have my key takeaways from this episode, but before we get into that, I want to share a clip with you from our discussion with Ustad Ubaidullah Evans on how your perceptions were carefully crafted. British Imperial Raj, right? When the British ruled India. And he was saying that they would make officers retire from active service at the age of 40, right? Because they wanted their brown subjects to always see white men at their peak. I mean, I don't want, like, I want you to almost see us at our very best, at our fittest, at our most capable, because I don't want you to see even just the natural kind of cycle of, you know, you know, human peaks and then of course the inevitable valleys. Like, I don't want you to see me in a natural way. If you enjoyed this discussion with James, I am sure you'll also enjoy the episode with Ustad Abedullah. Check it out wherever you're listening to this. It is episode number 34. Now here are my key takeaways. Number one, the right name can explode your business. Don't rush this part of the process and really think through what the right name is. And number two, in your calls to action, give your customers the next step. Don't skip to the last thing that you want them to do. And that is all for this episode. If you enjoyed this discussion, the easiest way to help out is to go to YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're really pushing to grow this channel right now and it doesn't cost a thing to subscribe. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next episode.